class. Yes. I'm so so. <laughs> All right. So, my name is Father Joplin Lally. I'm Paula's father and the senior ministry. And uh, I teach a lot of classes here on contemplation and uh, mysticism, communication skills. So it's a joy to be with you today on this one, since it's something I think a lot of us have in common. Huh? So uh, let's ask the Lord to guide us as we take another look at this the issue of anxiety. We begin as always, not in our own name, but always united, connected. And so we pray together in the name of the Loving and gracious God, we come before you with, with great hunger for that kind of connection with you that only makes sense in our lives, that brings it all together, that gives us that kind of footing and grounding that we need to face the issues and anxieties of our day in such a way that we know that not alone, that we are embraced by you, enveloped by your love. So help us never to forget this. And we pray this in the name and in the power of Jesus, your Son and our brother, forever and ever. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> so let's just go quickly and introduce yourselves. Uh, uh, we can do I'm Karen Price, Katie. Mary Masters, Kathleen Black, Katie Staley, Mike Staley, Paula, okay. Alexia Allen, All right. Karen Dodgers, All right. Kurt Fiedel, Anxious Ann Yusikowski, no. okay. <laughs> and Annie Peacock. Hey, okay. All right. Anxious Ann. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> This is not AA, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm sure we come with a lot of our own uh, questions in terms of what this might all be about, but uh, what I want to... Uh, anxiety, is that anxiety? Huh? Okay. And we're grateful to Kelly and McLaughlin here for putting these little fancy things in the, in the PowerPoint for She's <laughs> unbelievable in her talents. So garden variety anxiety, huh? Um, it's this vague sense of fear and uneasiness, dread, anguish, worry. Uh, and it's vague, it's not pinpointed. If, if it was pinpointed, it would be fear. But anxiety is that loose fitting, one size fits all uneasiness. And so we're not looking at the pathological incapacitating kinds of anxiety which would fit into the uh, areas of psychology known as psychosis, but uh, just the ordinary garden variety neuroses, you know, anxiety. And uh, we all tend to have these, and so we'd just like to look at some of the causes and so we, we might be able to address them. All right? So, possible cause of anxiety. A good friend of mine, I uh, have been teaching, I taught with him here in Grand Rapids back in the 70s, and then I moved to Boston, and he did too, and I had his wedding out there, and now he lives in um, Vermont, and he has just uh, written a book on um, uh, consciousness raising. And so it, he, I asked him, Give me his comments on anxiety, and this is what he, he wrote, okay? So, who's going to read this for us with a lot of anxiety? I mean, with a lot of emphasis. <laughs> but enthusiasm, who's going to do this? Okay, Karen. Um, possible cause of, oh, is that what you mean, or no? The smartphone. Okay. The smartphone can easily act as a substitute for a deep sense of our own worth. We check Facebook a hundred times a day just to be assured that we still exist and have value in the eyes of our million friends. 
Without this constant reassurance, we experience ourselves as falling down a deep hole into oblivion, getting smaller and smaller until we simply disappear into the void, into nothingness. Facebook assures us that we are still vital by being connected to the network and being accepted within its ever-shifting embrace. It is our link to vitality in the absence of any real sense of our, of our sonship and daughterhood in Christ. What our link to technology upholds is the illusion of the false self, to be further developed later in this presentation. Technology substitutes for what God used to be for the egocentric person. Technology has become the God the ego now appeals to for relief of its deep sense of being so dwarfed in a world that appears so much larger than its small little self. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Alright, so um, what do you think? Does this ring true? Does it resonate with you? Um, if not, why not? What do you think? I've avoided a smartphone so far. Okay, alright. <laughs> How many have smartphones? Uh, <laughs> How many phones are smarter than they are? <laughs> okay. So, uh, they're making, making quite a segment here about like Facebook and it's, uh, uh, it's an attempt maybe to help us not feel like we're lost in this very complex world and, and uh, dwarfed by the complexities of everything. Does that make any sense? I, 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 my sister, about four or five years ago, got me on uh, Facebook. She said, oh, you just got to be on it, it's where it's at and all that. <laughs> So I signed up for it, but I probably have not opened Facebook in five years more than about a dozen times, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would not say I'm the hundred time a day user, okay? Mm -hmm. And so just a couple of weeks ago after it came out that all these problems arose, identity and all that, I just, I signed out, okay? I said no more, I, I got myself off. But some of you, are, are any of you on Facebook here? No. Very little. Very little. Uh, does this does it help in the sense of helping one that if you're on Facebook or any of the social media, does it do anything to help you feel connected? I don't feel connected at all. I, it's it's a pain in the neck. Is what it oh, is to okay. me. But. Okay. Anybody have any other opinions? I, I use it for my family because all of my family is out of state. Oh, okay. So. Okay. I do feel connected with them because of that, but I don't, I don't use it for other purposes either. So okay. I mean, I, I don't air anything on it. I post something every once in a while that might be meaningful to somebody, but you know. Okay. But I do use it. So you, Kim, and they, what's your name? Cameron. Cameron. Yeah, yeah. You, you've been to Hoover Four. Mm -hmm. All right. Good to have you back, Cameron. Yeah, you had a question. You had Yana. Well, you know, I was just going to say that I think. Um, I think for me, like, Facebook can go one of two ways because I've, I've certainly had the opportunity to meet and connect with lots of people, yeah. um, and and that's actually it's actually how I communicate with a lot of clients and and you know other just just people I know. It's how I make plans. It's how I like get invited to events. It's how I stay in the know. You know, so essentially, I would I would lose a significant part of my social circle if I weren't on it. Okay. Um, but the prob the problem I think is is that. Sometimes I, 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 a lot of the time during the day, I just feel this sense of, ah, what's next? What am I supposed? What am I supposed to be doing? What am I? You know, and uh, and so, Facebook and other social media kind of like fills that that void a little bit. But it, it kind of it kind of reminds me of like eating a hamburger or chocolate or whatever, where you get that fast fix and then you don't feel great afterward. And you're like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, techni technically. Technically, like eating McDonald's all the time is healthier than eating nothing at all. Technically, it actually is nutri nutritious, right, yeah. and that's kind of how I see Facebook. Like, technically, it is, it is connection, mm -hmm. but it's like maybe not the same way. Okay, humans are. Okay, so it's pros and cons, right? Okay. I see you. You came in late. What's your name? Angela. Angela. Uh -huh. Okay, another A A here. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three A's, right? Yeah. Triple A here, if anybody's car broke down. 
Okay, anybody else? That's a good well, thank you. For Angela that. needs to talk. Okay. No, I actually, I kind of feel that way about Facebook is similar to Cam. However, I use it for the respect of like my faith. I love to share my faith on it. And I feel like it's like a way for people in the world that are so interested in their self image to receive the Lord. So I kind of love it for that point. And I um, also reference it for like, my sister has Parkinson's. So there's a Parkinson's Facebook group. Mm -hmm. So I use it for other knowledge to help me help her. Okay. So okay. yeah. Okay, all right. So once again, pluses, minuses, huh? Okay. Um, I was, last of, last month for the uh, Best Kept Secrets of uh, April, uh, we looked at uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, the cell phone and, uh, and um, someone perhaps in addictions in terms of uh, uh, cell phones and smartphones and so forth. And one of the things that struck me was someone's comment that said um, they find themselves in a constant sense of anticipation of what that next Twitter or, or a text message is going to be. So that it's, it's, you're just waiting for that new one to come in and they can't really relish and savor what was before because they're anticipating the new one and it's just living in the future kind of a thing. Does that ring true? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, good. All right. Well, you even like, if you, you hear your cell phone go off and you're like, oh, I wonder what that is, you know? Yeah, and, right, yeah. Like even, even making plans, like yeah. you wait around hoping that somebody's going to text something and this is, one comes in and you're like, this is good. This is a good plan for the evening, but let's see if anything else comes in. <laughs> and then the next one comes in and you're like, okay, okay, that one's better. That one's actually better. And then, and then like, and then two people ditch the first one, and then three people ditch the second one, and you're like, well, okay. And then a third one comes in, and you're like, aha! And yeah, so that's, and that's just typical planning. And this it's is a disaster. Kind of, this is the kind of planning that drives anyone who's planning events absolutely bonkers. Because you're trying to get people to commit themselves to something three weeks from now, a month from now. And uh, people, a lot of people just, they don't want to commit themselves. They want to see if there's something else better, and if, they're committed to themselves now, and something else comes better, and then, you know. And so, and here I used to, was, I was in charge of Hispanic Youth Ministry for the Archdiocese of Boston for 20 years. And I tried try to get a lot of retreats going, and educational <coughs> programs, and so forth and so on. And uh, a lot of the people would just not want to commit themselves. And they, they might show up at the last minute, but as far as planning ahead, so you could see how many meals you needed and all that, I know we had a... Re a weekend retreat one time, and and uh, I remember being in the parking lot of the uh, Central Catholic High School there, and I think we had planned for about a hundred people to come in, and because we had made arrangement for people to take them in in their homes to sleep and all that, and all of a sudden about 200, 250 oh. showed up. Oh. Didn't didn't say they were coming in. All of a sudden, no. there they are with their sleeping bags on the you know. Bedlam, bedlam. I, I get nightmares every time I think about it. <laughs> okay. Okay, wait, this is con the conclusion of Robert Thiefel's thing here, so who can read this for us now? Okay. <laughs> Those who seem to have made it, who have found in the culture in its institutions the protection of the small self in the face of feeling like nobody are held in high esteem. Their way is emulated, their wealth and celebrity and the celebrity it brings are envied. They have found a way to deal with the underlying anxiety of feeling insignificant in the face of overpowering and potentially devastating technological advances. What this all points to is an absence of any sense of feeling accepted and loved by a gracious and loving God. Anxiety just might be the result of having the experience of disappearing in a multitude of separate selves, all vying for the fame and fortune on a planet seen as very limited. Anxiety increases as we experience our lack of connectedness to each other, to our deepest self, and to God. Anxiety increases when we perceive others as much more capable and powerful than we are, and we are vying for the same goods, we still think we need to be somebody. 
no wonder why you seek the ephemeral connectedness of Facebook in the face of so much disconnection. Facebook becomes our community, even as we stand all alone, staring into the screen of our smartphones. Yeah. If we could use Facebook to organize for reality, for, or to organize for real community, it might become a more useful tool. Our anxiety is reduced when we come together to work for the good of others. For in doing this, we are also loving ourselves in something larger than ourselves. Okay, this is Robert Nichols, my friend from 1973. Uh, we've been to Europe together. He and his wife and I have traveled together to Italy and Spain and Greece. And, uh, our, we just love to travel, okay? So, we use our frequent flower miles and uh, use Airbnb and, you know, very inexpensive. But anyway, he wrote, he's just written this book called Standing in the Midst of Grace Essays on Living in Christ Consciousness. It's a great, uh, I'm looking forward to it. He's going to send me the book as soon as he gets it. So it's his Christ Consciousness, this sense of awareness of, of our true self. You know, Thomas Burton speaks of the true self and false self. And uh, the false self is, is who we think we are. Okay? And who others think we are. But it's not who we really are. Who are we really? What's our true self? I think Paul tells us in Colossians 2, uh, verse 3, we are a hidden treasure in God. Okay? We are hidden in God, in Christ. And so we, our true self is who we are in God. See, that's the connected part, in God. Not just in our individual selves. And this is what we're dealing with in, in anxiety. It's this sense of loneliness. And loneliness is increasing. It's increasing. Even though we're more connected than ever in, in Twitter and, you know, Facebook and text and email, um, you know, we just instantly, something happens in the other part of the world and within 30 seconds we know about it, we just, and in that way it increases our anxiety because, mm -hmm. you know, 150 years ago, it might be three months before you hear that there was a volcano eruption over in Italy, and uh, it just immediately, you know, it just comes on our screen, comes right into our living room. We see the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and all this, and all this travesty and, and, and pain. And uh, Henry Nouwen wrote a beautiful essay one time uh, about um, compassion and the 7 o'clock news. It was all about this sense of, we're just put before us all this pain all over the world. And our basic instance says, why are you showing me this? What can I do about it, you know? And it's a sense of, I'm, I'm connected, I'm seeing it, but I'm helpless to change it, okay? So that's not always been the case, but it has now with the, uh, the media, all right? So anything else in here that grabs your picture? What stands out for you in that, that paragraph? Look at it over real closely. Give it a reread and tell me what leaps off the page at you. Well, it's the buying for the same goods. Um, you know, people are looking at things in the eye aspect of, I see you this way, and I want to look like somebody special. You know, and I feel like we're looking for that special um, <clears throat> cure, like online, even. Like, whether it's envying someone's account or choosing to do the same because we're so interested in ourself, and it's not, it's just not godly. So that's the hard part for me is I just, feel so self-exposed and it's just not what what God intended for my life so that's how I feel about it okay so I think when I heard you say it your first name is Angela and, and, okay and it, I it seems you bring up this uh, common theme of Richard Moore scarcity uh, there's only so much to go around you know, only so much fame to go around and money and uh, possessions and power. So I got to
grab for all the gusto I can, you know, like the old beer ad, you know, uh, because it's just not enough. And so it's scarcity. And so this ties in with the uh, Roar's things about the three main uh, temptations of Jesus in the desert were the temptations for power, prestige, you know, throwing himself off the temple, you know, and possessions. The three P's, the three things that we think can alleviate our pain, our loneliness, our suffering, uh, our meaning, give meaning to our life, and so we grab for all the gusto we can in being the most powerful. Number one, I think that's why we put so much emphasis on, on uh, sports and everything. We, we identify with the team, and when the team wins, we win. Okay, and when we li they lose, we lose. And it's just like, you know, it's an identification thing. It's a search for power. Be number one. Prestige, okay, we want to be known. And I think a lot of the um, issues that we have with, with the uh, um, well, mass killings is starting with people who want to be known. They want to get their name in the paper. And the thing I think is true that we would rather be infamous if we can't be famous. We just want to be. We just want to have our name out there and not get lost in the crowd, okay? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So the possessions, of course, uh, the one with all the, has the most toys when they die wins, okay? Mm -hmm. It's this idea of more and more and more, and when is enough enough? You know, I think everybody's having garage sales about this time of year, you know. They've <laughs> collected all this stuff they didn't need all year long, and now they're trying to sell it so they can get more money and buy more stuff they don't need, you know. It's like, <laughs> You know, when, when do we stop? You know, when is enough enough? That's a basic spiritual question. It really is. And a basic uh, cause for a lot of anxiety. We just have no, we have no sense of this picture of when I've got this, I have all I need. I don't really need anymore. I've got one car and I've got one house and I've got one TV and everything. And, and that's enough. Uh, I don't have to have a TV in every room, you know. I don't have to have three cars. Uh, I mean, it's just like, when is enough enough? And there's no sense of gratitude. No, that's that's the issue. There's no gratitude. It's like, I deserve it. It's this, uh -huh. this sense of uh, entitlement. You know, I worked hard for a living, and you deserve a break today. Go to McDonald's, right? Or wherever, you know. Uh, <coughs> entitlement. And a lot of that gets in the whole idea of people living in the future. They're putting up with this uh, business called life because they think, well, I'll get my reward later, okay? When I die, I'll go to heaven and I'll be happy, you know. Well, you know, someone once said, it's heaven all the way to heaven and hell all the way to hell. <laughs> you know? And you kind of... You don't, one of my favorite quotes is from Lewis Evely, you don't gain heaven, you get used to it. You know? Pope John Paul II came out and just said that heaven and hell are not geographical places. It's very clear. He's got it written in the quotation. They're states of consciousness. Okay? And, and it's not a place. You can't go to a place when you're a spirit. There's no place to go to. You're a spirit. You're a, so you're talking about going to heaven. We picture these little harps and angels and all that, but that's all illusion. It's not a place. And there's no such thing as time after we die. It's all present moment. Now. So if we don't know how to live in the now, and we're always living in the future, always living in the past, uh, we're missing this present moment of now where the reign of God is. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is when? Now. Mm -hmm. no, he didn't say tomorrow. The kingdom of heaven, isn't it? We don't believe that, though. You know, we think, you know, I'll just put up with this lousy job or this lousy spouse or whatever, these lousy children, and, and uh, I'll give my reward later, okay? <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. <laughs> Maybe I struck home. Okay. <laughs> Looking at our 
anxiety from a spiritual perspective. The primary spiritual perspective that ties in with our garden variety anxieties seems to be the relevance of our image of God. If I were to ask you to draw your image of God, I wonder what you would come up with. Anybody have an idea? If you, what would you come up with an image of God? What would you start writing? Your image of God, what would it be? Uh, yeah. I mean, I could draw it for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, well, okay. here you go. So, and this is my honest image of God. This okay. isn't my, this isn't my, like, what I feel like I know is right. But okay. I kind of see him as up here. I'm a very great artist. And he has this spreadsheet. An Excel? <laughs> yeah, it's an Excel spreadsheet. And it keeps scores on there. <laughs> And there's this giant wall, and then I'm down here among this huge mass of other people. And I have no idea what that spreadsheet is or how to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not get that spreadsheet revealed to me until after I die, so I have no, I have no feedback. No uh, oh. feedback here. And you know, my sense is that if that's your image of God, you might be living just in a wee bit of anxiety, all right? Correct. <laughs> you know, just my guess, Your Honor. But anybody else? I feel like, you know, he's just got this big hug waiting for me. I just have the biggest love love surrounding me constantly. It's not even an image. It's just pure, sincere love. Okay. Always. Okay. Always? Always. I just think he's a ever-loving father, okay. you know, Prince of Peace. Well, this, this brings up that interesting... Um, something that's going around today among theologians and saying that God is much more a verb than a noun. Huh? <clears throat> really? A verb is love. love. Love is not a... You don't have love that's not in action, do you? It's, it's, it's loving. It's constant action. <coughs> so there's no you know, old man up there with a the beard and everything, you know. It's, it's the, it, Richard Roy would describe it as the divine dance. I, I mm -hmm. took this course on the divine dance a couple of years ago. And uh, he said the Trinity is more this, this dance between the Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, the energy there is not in, in any of the three persons. It's in the energy between the three. And that's what scientists are saying now, that the energy is not in the atom or the molecule, it's in the interaction between. Okay? So it's this relationship is what we're talking about. Well, that's beautiful. I like that. Thanks. Who else? Image of God. Very important. I think of creation. I just, when I think of God, I think of all the beautiful things in the world that I've seen that spoke to me of God. The revelations of God, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Images, okay, good. Beautiful. Anybody else? I think of a friend. Okay. Um, you know, and a friend, a good friend, you can yell at him. Right, yeah. And they'll accept it, you know. Um, and always there. The friend is the one that knows everything about you, and they say, mm -hmm. I know everything, and I still love you. Mm -hmm. And that's the way God is. So that means really God is not judging us. Because you don't you can't fall in love with someone who's judging you. You stay away from them and you separate yourselves and you uh, you know, kind of anxious about the whole thing, but you're not in love. If you think somebody's gonna judge you, do you think you can fall in love with them? I've spent a lot of time reading and teaching on this whole issue of judgment and uh, I think that the judgment scene that's presented in Matthew 25 and the rest of it is a, it's a parable, and uh, I think the but judgment is going to be this big revelation of how much God loves us and how much we have not realized it, and we're going to just it's going to be painful because we're going to see wow we missed the boat it was all over the place and, and I missed it you know and it, that's the pain of growth, okay? But it's, God does not, is not going to punish us. 
you know, you know, I can't imagine. The God that I know and love is not a punishing God, okay? Not a torturous God. Not, not, not someone who's going to burn the hell out of you, you know? I don't know how, how else I can explain it. There are some people, though, that they, they want that reward and punishment game. Oh, my gosh, why? Because they have a sense of control there. I've got a sense of, and my ego has a sense of control. I can either get there or not, and I'm the one to take responsibility. It's not about this. All is gift. It's all gift. You can achieve it, merit it, deserve it, or gain it. It's just pure gift. And our ego thinks, well, I don't like that. Money didn't grow on trees. There's such a thing as a free, free lunch. Excuse me. We don't like anything free because we're yeah. looking for the strings attached. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen? So we're very suspicious of anything free. We think we got to gain it. And this has caused us so much anxiety because we end up thinking, well, I haven't done enough. I'm not pure enough, generous enough, giving enough, smart enough. Okay, that's the scarcity thing again, right? God says, did you hear me? I love you as you are. I could not love you any more than I do right now because my nature is love. My DNA is love. And you're not strong enough to change my nature. And I can't even change my nature. My nature is love. 1 John 4, 3 says God is love. That's God's nature. So God cannot not love us. This is probably the thing that we need to hear more than anything else in the world. God cannot not love us because God cannot go against God's nature. Now, ego says, wait a minute, I, I, I've never been taught that. What's wrong with this? Now, well, think about it. Can God go against God's nature and not love? So, God just says, you know what? I love you. Deal with it. <laughs> You can't change my mind, all right? Okay. Okay. Primary spiritual protective, okay. Our image is distant, punishing, counting, conditionally loving God, and we ourselves will be capable of entering into a deep, trusting, mystical relationship of love with this kind of God. An alternative image of God is that which arises from my entering into deep, silent prayer, contemplation, mysticism, which comes not from our mind, but from our deepest prayer experience. See, we can't think our way into a relationship with God. And that's the error we've made so many for so long in putting so much emphasis on the intellect and uh, learning about God. Theology is the study of God. It's wonderful. I spent four years straight studying moral theology and, and sacramental theology and and uh, dogmatic theology and every other theology you can think of. And, uh, but information is not the same thing as transformation. We can be PhDs in scripture theology and everything else and not be transformed. We can be selfish, afraid, anxious people all our lives, even though we've got 25 degrees after our name. So it's not information, it's transformation. What's the difference? One fills your head and the other changes your heart. Oh, I like that. And I'm like, can I quote you on that? Other one? <laughs> <laughs> one fills your, what is it? One fills your head. One fills your head. The other one changes your heart. Hey, I like it. I want to remember that. I got to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else writing that down? I'm, I'm writing it down. The Holy Spirit is what I was thinking. Like, you know, information is facts. It's there. Transformation takes the Holy Spirit. So many people don't use the Holy Spirit in their life. It's just dead. Right. Well, also, and it says in there that um, silent prayer. How many people sit in silence and ask God to sit with them? Most people are talking to God, not listening to God. And that's where they miss the boat. It's all about listening and not doing. We're human beings, not human doings. <clears throat> all right? 
we put so much sense on doing and learning uh -huh. instead of sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. Mary was waiting. <clears throat> it says she mm -hmm. held all these things in her heart. You know, you have that. There, you, you could have the quotations of Mary. Uh, not, I'm sure that there's not more than five in, in the whole scripture. So she's not one that's, you know, noted for uh, dogmatical statements. She lived it, okay? She, she didn't say, when the angel asked her to be the mother of Jesus, here's what she didn't say. Well, you got the right lady here. I can do it. Anybody, <laughs> anybody can do it. I can do it. Bring it on, okay? Did she say that? We can imagine her saying that. What did she say? How can this be? Let it be done to me. She didn't say, I'll do it. Ego says, I'll do it. Because I want the credit, thank you. But the Spirit says, let it be done to me. You're going to do it. I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to allow you to do it. And that's all God needs is our permission. Because God's given us free will. Okay. And for, if we, we don't interact with this, it's not a full transaction. Oh my gosh, I'm getting all sidetracked here. <laughs> okay, oh, that was a good one, Kelly. She just blew that away on me. <laughs> all right, who's going to read this for me? Okay, Kevin. Rohr says that the mystics are those who have been let in on a big and wondrous love secret. Anyone not privy to an inner dialogue, that is, some kind of I-thou relationship, would call such people presumptuous, emotional, foolish, or even arrogant. How could they presume to claim an actual union with the divine? But this is without doubt God's secret, in which all jewels of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Colossians 2, 2 through 3. Uh, beautiful Colossians. One's biggest secrets and deepest desires are usually revealed to others, and even discovered by ourselves, in the presence of sorrow, failure, or need, when we are very vulnerable, and when one feels entirely safe in the arms of someone's love. That's from that beautiful book, Immortal Diamond. And you can find uh, all these, a lot of these books of Roar, Immortal Diamond, Divine Dance, um, oh my gosh, uh, what is some, uh, falling upward, all these kind of things. I've uh, taught these over the years and uh, gone through and page by page and outlined them and they are now in PowerPoints. In the archives of the Catholic Information Center, right Kelly? Yes, they're all there. And how do they find them? Oh, your PowerPoints? Yeah. They have to write to us or call and ask for them. What? They're on the PowerPoint, aren't they on the video, on the uh, website? Well, the videos are, but Pardon not me. the PowerPoints. No, the videos are, which the has videos. the PowerPoint in the yes, video. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> I thought you were just saying the, the Oh, the, the, the written pages? Yeah. No. <coughs> no, we're talking about the videos, which include the yes. PowerPoint. Too. So just look on the uh, website, okay? On the website, and we have a YouTube page, so it has all of Father Joachim's uh, classes, we videotape all of them. Yes, I am so <laughs> privileged. I, I <laughs> okay, uh, the only problem is all these things are recorded in case I uh, get uh, accused of heresy, they've got proof. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, live dangerously. Okay. <laughs> So it's when we, when you, I like this. Our biggest secrets and deepest desires are usually revealed to others and even discovered by ourselves in the presence of sorrow, failure, or need when we're very vulnerable and we one feels entirely safe in the arms of someone else's love. Wow, that says it all. And you know how this resonates so much in today's um, lecturers. Um, I've just finished listening to. Uh, Brene Brown's uh, beautiful book on uh, the uh, Braving the Wilderness. I've listened to it several times. And, and I may be teaching that next fall. I'm thinking about it, you know. You all like her? Do you like Brene Brown? She's good. She's good. Yes. You know, if you don't mind her little um, 
uh, words sometimes that you would not use in pride and nice company or whatever. But <laughs> she's perfect. She's beautiful. And uh, she says it like it is. She's from Texas. You know, so down where I'm from, I'm from Arkansas. So uh, she's right next door in Texas. And we used to play, Arkansas, we used to play Texas in the big Arkansas Razorback Texas Longhorn game. And everybody would stop breathing when that game went on. Because that was, <laughs> that was the event of the year. Okay, they don't play them anymore, but <laughs> big rivalry. Okay. So, but there's this resonance that she's saying the same thing. She talks about vulnerability. She talks about shame. You know, she talks about the difference between fitting in and belonging. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. She's not even ordained. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see where we are now. Tell you what, let's, we had enough little input and verbiage here. Let's break up in those small groups and get you a, have, give you a chance to express how you feel among your fellow small group people, okay? So we have uh, 6, 7, 13. Okay, so uh, you want to break up uh, three groups or two groups? What do you like? <laughs> three groups would be about four each. Let's do three. Okay, let's do, let's do four groups. Let's do three groups, okay? So let's just be, pick, uh, okay, who's going to be here? We want to separate men and wife? Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we separate. <laughs> and the marriage sacrament says that no one put them asunder. No. Joachim is putting them asunder right now. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, why don't we uh, have the four of you, we're going to ask you, Karen, and uh, then what, first, first, Mike, get Mike to come over here and join with Karen, is it? Alexia. What? Alexia. Okay, so now I'll come back here, and uh, we're going to ask you. Yes, okay, yeah. And then, what's your name? Nick, how are you, Nick? Maybe we're going to find that out in a second. Introduce yourselves, give each other your, your yeah, name, well, your phone yeah. number, your social security number. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. But make sure you're acquainted, all right? I think it's refreshing. And I want you just to give some feedback to the other in terms of what so far we've looked at and what resonates with you. Resonate. Like a bell re resounds. That's where the word resonate comes from. It's resounding, resonating, sounding all over again. It's like what is kind of ringing true to you, and it's sort of, you still hear the vibrations. Sometimes truth does that to us. It just starts us reverberating in terms of growth. And so just think for a moment, you know, or look through your pages, <coughs> and see what leaps off the page at you as being really true to you and resonating with you. Okay? Go ahead. That's about 10 minutes or so. I'll go last since I missed a good part of it. <laughs> I just think that he brought up the world. I'm Karen. Um, somewhere with that. But anyways, I look at like the world, and then you have God, and then the two things, and we just have to figure out our place in those two areas. And like he said, the kingdom of heaven is now. So I always look at it that way. From the morning, I wake up, and I think, you know, the Lord knows where I need to be today, and that's the best comfort I have. So I, uh, you know, like, Facebook or social media to me. Here's just like when they're 
come to realize how do they take in this previous yeah. time. Yeah. Oh. People are more. Yeah, I think anymore. I never want to be in front of somebody. It makes it easier for them to think well. You know, she said a nice thing. So pray for you and hopefully they'll come back with you. Foundation, all that just society. That's why I'm really doing the right thing, and it's great to see. Yeah, why? I mean, why did like the spreadsheets? The spreadsheet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm fascinated by the idea of simply experiencing God's grace and not worrying about having yeah. help. Um, it occurs to me that you need to keep it simple and just experience God's love. Um, if you get off into these other tangents, it's like resistance, and then you don't experience the simple beauty of it. So that's the church. I, I, that sounds beautiful. I don't know that I would know how to just accept and explore His grace. I think it means you just remember that He loves you. Yeah. And then you respond in positive ways out of gratitude and love. Wow. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. And they had six kids. On a feeling level, I know he mentioned the uh, being an intellectual pursuit, getting in our ways, right? Or, or something along those lines. I know I heard him talking about it. I'm not sure which part it was, but. You can't think our way into relationship Think our way into relationship with God. And that's exactly what I tried to do there, right? I'm like, okay, Kurt, so explain to me how I would do that. <laughs> Right? <laughs> it's like you can't. It's not the way it works, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> because of that desire for the thing that resonates most with me here is significance. But I still feel like there's expectations that we do good, you know? Sure. What do you mean by significance? Well, I think I heard you saying, Father, that we're supposed to keep it simple, just experience God's love. And respond out of gratitude and love. If you get off into these other tangents, oh, I miss Sunday's mass. Da -da -da -da. You, it's almost a form of resistance that keeps you from experiencing God's love. Well, I think the main thing is like you make yourself vulnerable to God loving you as you are. And in doing that, you are going against your ego, which wants to accuse you, wants to say you don't raise your eyes, you don't love good enough, how can God love you unconditionally when you don't love yourself? Yeah, it's a struggle. And it's a constant. I've never been here. The ego always wants to be in control. The very essence of being in relationship with God or with anybody that is vulnerability. So that's why I refuse to read the prayer of this Mass about the Almighty and all powerful God. So that's that's my fear. The crucifix. Do you see somebody all powerful? Oh, there's one with a tiny little thing. But we don't see it. It's like running in person. It's like running in person. Jesus became all about you. You're pretty quiet. You enter into the conversation, and when you're silent and you're not talking, you know, you're being vulnerable. You open the door for divine energy. God can come and sweep you off your feet. I think you need to have some sort of focus still with that because I think a big part of resistance to people being alone with themselves is the criticism that you have about them. So just, if I were to say, all right, I'm going to, 20, 20 minutes, three times a week, I'm going to go in contemplative prayer, probably like the first three times that I do that, I'm going to say it was miserable because all I did was think about how I snapped at somebody today and that I'm not worthy of God's love and, you know, just beat myself up. If I don't have some sort of intention or way to say this is part of the process and now I need to wait until God's grace just comes upon me. You don't try to push the river. Yeah. This is where it's been. You don't push the river. The river is flowing. You don't try to push it. You try, don't try to make it happen. And then the want to be in control. I want to solve my problems now. I want to get rid of my ego that's accused me of this, and I want to get rid of it. That's a sign that you're not vulnerable. You're wanting to be in control. <laughs> and when you're in silent prayer, you are just. You know, waiting there for God to ambush you. You don't know 
remember when it's coming. Yeah. So, um, there's, there's Sometimes I think that, like, if you, like, for me, if I say the rosary or something, or if you just read a passage in the Bible, you just, like, I'm having this issue, and then you open up, and sometimes it's helpful, or you turn to, or, I mean, it, it kind of starts the positive thinking, if you're, like, thinking negative. But once again, it's not the information. Right. By the time you look in the Bible, I'm going to get this passage. I'm going to give you the information I need to be. Only so goes this far. You know, <coughs> let that go. Everything is ready to go. And that's the same way with the sinner prayer. You're letting go of all these planning that you're doing for tomorrow's dinner or whatever it is. And you're letting it go. But you, it's just foolish to let anything go if you're not convinced that someone is supporting you. You get what you're trying to that's that radical trust. It's very small. Oh, yeah. That's, that's dying. That's dying. And that's all the preparation, the I mean, final you know, letting go of your breath, your last breath. That everything in life is preparation for that final letting go of your That's total holiness. That's, 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 that's what Jesus said on the cross. That's nothing but to do. Like she's okay. Had a bunch of okay. Okay. Let's try to wrap it up in about two minutes. Okay. Does anyone here do centering prayer? Well, I like to be by myself. I like adoration. I like you know. Sitting there, like meditation, I guess you would say that more so. Do you? Yeah. Um, I've tried it so much. Father Lally has seen a lot of classes on it. Um, I think it's a lot like Eastern meditation, but the focus is a little different. Uh, I think in Centering Prayer, you're aware of God. You're aware of God. I don't know what Eastern <laughs> yeah. are aware of. You're right. Most of them don't believe it. That's my job description. <laughs> And that might really help us the <laughs> structure issue that I was alluding to, you know, that there is, okay, this is the prescribed recipe to, we can't make you feel those feelings, but we can give you the place where those feelings could come up, right? Okay, you ready to go? Sometimes, too, just like sitting there with a cup of coffee in the morning and like you know, I mean, just or this picture of the Seventh inning stretch now. Just kind of make yourself available, I guess. There's an interesting DVD that I found about. Okay. Now we're getting a little more. <clears throat> a little more roar here. But giving oneself over to God is our lifelong goal. It's all about letting go, as I was speaking with the group here. All of spiritual life can be summed up in those two words, letting go. Letting go of your need to know everything and to be in control of everything and, and uh, predict everything. And, you know, it, it's all the ego. And it's it's in competition with God, and so you're not going to want to be alone with God in deep prayer if you're in competition. So, those who never go there always remain small and superficial and unconnected to themselves. That's anxiety. You would normally experience it as a lack of substance or even reality in a person. People who have avoided all intimacy normally do not know who they are in any depth, and cannot tell others who they are. Okay. So, you know, the word intimacy, <clears throat> anybody can tell me what etymology of intimacy? The root words and so forth? Where does the word come from? Intimacy. Into me? <laughs> okay, well, the word in has various meanings, but a lot of times, friendly.
sentence inflammable. It's interesting because they say something is inflammable. The in here means without, without <coughs> flames. Okay? And so it would be much more correct to say it's flammable, not inflammable. So in makes it not flammable. Okay? In means without here. And this, I believe, is the derivative of the word timor in Latin, which means fear. So intimacy means without fear, just opening up, being vulnerable. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I'll give you my address so you can send me a check. Here you go. All right. It seems that garden variety anxiety is intimately tied in with one not being aware of their true identity. Uh, Rory put so much emphasis on identity. Then if you know who you are, your identity, you know, everything else falls into place. The problem is when we don't know who we are, when we live in illusion, when we look for these three Ps to take care of ourselves and who we are, that's when we're in trouble. Rory says that our true self is who we are in Christ, in Christo. You look through the Bible and you'll find so many references to in Christ. We suffer in Christ, we die in Christ, we rise in Christ. It's all in Christo, which is the uh, Christ consciousness. It's the uh, cosmic Christ. You know, uh, we need to always make this distinction between Jesus and the cosmic Christ. <laughs> Jesus of Laz Lazarus lived for 33-something years, you know, and uh, was crucified, okay? Jesus of Nazareth became the cosmic Christ. And the cosmic Christ includes all of us, includes all of creation from, from before the world began. It's this, this the Christ without limits, the cosmic. And uh, so it's like uh, Jesus is included in this, but like one of Roy's famous uh, phrases, is it, it, in, it transcends and includes, okay? Transcends and includes. What does that mean? You go to the next level, but all that came before is still part of you. Exactly. You've been in too, too many of these classes. <laughs> you know, like you go into college, but you don't uh, put down the fact that you went through high school and grade school and all that. That's all the, you include that, but you're transcending it, you're going beyond it, but it's all included. So we don't have to exclude. See, we so often want to, oh, I'm just, I'm not that kind of person anymore, you know? I was in a sex. Uh, drugs and rock and roll, and I'm not there anymore. Yeah, that, that's part of your history, my friend. You still, that's all included. Don't exclude it because that's who you are. And you need to know your full identity. <laughs> okay. All right. So, it seems that garden variety anxiety is definitely tied in with not being aware of your true identity. I like that. Kelly, the searching in the moon there. Where'd he go? Where'd you find that? Okay. <laughs> She's got this getting place for all these little images. Talk about image of God. She's got an image um, treasure somewhere. All right. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that. That's good art. Okay. Who's going to read this? Okay. And... One gets the sense that so much anxiety occurs as a result of one's not yet having discovered one's true self, and as a result, settling for less in the sense that one's identity is tied up with one's accomplishments, good looks, wealth, popularity, etc. One cannot escape an existential sense of anxiety, loneliness, estrangement, etc., unless this God-given challenge of God to find one's true self is met. Okay, so
So your ex ex existential sense of anxiety, this is this vague sense of, of um, you know, you, you, you don't feel complete, you feel uneasy, you don't know why, something's missing, uh, and you try all these ways to fill it and they don't work. This is the existential sense of anxiety. Uh, and it's constantly with us. It's part of the human nature. No one gets through life without it. And the loneliness, I've taught a lot of courses on loneliness, and the diff difference between loneliness and being alone. You know, there's nothing worse than being in a group of people and feeling extremely lonely. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather be by myself and lonely than with a crowd and lonely. All right. <laughs> so, if we so now that we've read this, we recognize that in ourselves, right? But what if we, if there are people in our lives that we recognize them struggling with the same thing, what what do we say to them? Okay. Let me hear what you would say to yourself at that question. I would say these are the causes and address the cause, you know, with, you know, through God, it will fill your need. That's what I'd say to myself, but okay. I feel I have a strong faith in God. Okay. And not everybody in my world has that same strong faith. Okay. It's a good point, you know? Now, let me challenge you, Nick. You just used a word that is uh, probably one of the most common words that we use in any church. And it is faith. What is faith? Believing something you cannot understand or see. Okay, that's one definition. Who else? Cooperation with God. Believing in something that's bigger than ourselves. Okay, then you get. What does believe mean? I'm always one of these people that go, then what? Then what? Then what? <laughs> <laughs> so, participate in something. Okay. Trust that God's going to get you through it. Okay, all right. This is a, a very important word, trust. Trust is more of an action word, more a verb, than it is a noun. Because trust involves participating, you know, trusting, um, relying upon whatever you want to do, okay? <coughs> Whereas, belief, uh, a lot of times is used as a content word. What do you believe in? I believe in climate change, I believe in, um, I believe in uh, democracy, I, you know, we all these things we believe in, okay? Uh, but they're content things, and then you say, oh, okay, I believe in democracy, okay, then Define democracy. You know, you're always pushing people to go deeper and deeper and deeper because one of the things that uh, I don't know if it's in this slide or one of the others is talking about superficiality. Superficiality is being staying on the surface. And Roy says this is another definition of sin. When you live superficially, because hmm. you're not going deep. A lot of people just want to stay on the surface and go to mass on Sundays and. You know, don't eat meat on Fridays and then all that. That's okay. That, you're a card-carrying Catholic now, okay? So you think you can go up to St. Peter and say, well, here's my card. I'm Catholic, and where's my reserve seat, okay? Well, maybe not, okay? It's a little more complicated than that, all right? But you see, you see how a lot of people, when they use the word believe, they have a sense of, of content involved. You believe in the Trinity, you believe in 
uh, incarnation, you believe in redemption. You see how that lends itself to that? The content dimension of it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, some people are saying, okay, they'd rather use the word trust rather than believe. Trust is, is not associated with content. It's a relational word, okay? And this is what, this is how I would define faith. It's a relationship thing. It's a verb. It's a, you know, you have this relationship. Giving and taking, back and forth, letting go, receiving. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it's, you know, this idea, okay, all you got to do is believe in Jesus as your personal Savior and you'll be saved. A lot of people do that, you know. Cam, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard that many times, over and over, right? And they throw up, do you believe in Jesus as your personal Savior? <laughs> you know, and then you're saved. <laughs> well, beautiful. <laughs> what are you saved from? Ourselves. What are you saved <laughs> for? <laughs> you know, what's this business of saving? Is that the same thing as the bank account? I mean, come on. Well, and what ends up happening, too, is... Um, then any doubt becomes scary to talk about or admit because you're like, oh my gosh, it'll jeopardize my my saved my savedness. Your savedness. So it's like, here, believe in unicorns or I'll shoot you in the head. And you're like, uh, I guess I do. I believe in unicorns. You know, and so you don't know if you you know don't know if you really do, but you're like, I better say I do, and I better squash all doubt down in my mind. And uh, this, otherwise. Yeah. You'll go straight to hell, you won't pass go, mm -hmm. you won't collect $200, you know, and it, there you are. It's like, saving is probably one of the root words we most need to look at, and that is because we need to say, who are we being saved from? My friends, our relationship with God saves us from the illusions of ourselves. The illusions that we are the end. We are the ones that count. We are the number one. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be saved from that illusion. Because another definition for sin, besides superficiality, is illusion. Satan comes from the uh, other, another word, I forgot the language, is America, maybe it's Aramaic, it means Satan, which means the accuser. Okay? So whenever you're accusing yourself or someone else is accusing you, that's, that's not love. You don't accuse people that you love. So you need to be saved from the accuser part of yourself, the part of yourself that's judging you and damning you and condemning you. That's who you need to be saved from because that's the one that's keeping you from being at peace. Does that make sense? So this is just, one of the things that I have always tried to challenge myself is how do you put churchy words into everyday life words? People that walk on the street that don't know anything about theology, and you start talking about redemption, incarnation, and, and being saved, and all this, and like, what are you talking about, you know? You need to get it in words that the relationship they understand. They know what it means to be in relationship and out of relationship, right? You know, the whole thing of, uh, used to be, well, Father did not commit a mortal sin, you know. How oh, was it a venial sin? Oh, <laughs> and it's like, when, if you broke up with your, you've been dating this uh, spouse or this, this person for 12 years, and all of a sudden you had this big spat, you broke up, and now you've moved to different continents or whatever, do you have any doubt that you broke up? That's a breaking of relationship, okay? So it's like the same thing with the sin, you know this idea of sin. Uh, can you break your love relationship with God by not going to church on Sunday? You think God will say, oops, you missed one Sunday, so sorry. You know, <laughs> you know excuse me, is this the God you want to spend all eternity with? I don't think so. You know? We need to rethink all these things, you know. And I know that, you know, some people are going to say, Wow, that joke about he is so far out. Oh my gosh, he's, you know, just uh, he's he not giving the party line here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know I'm always sticking my neck out by saying these things, but when you believe them, if you don't say them, you're being hypocritical. Right? 
Okay. So, what comes after the discovery of our true selves? We all know there's no graduation in regard to our growing awareness of who we are in Christ. But once this awareness is somewhat sensed and partially accepted, we are on a more firm footing as we confront the other less crucial anxieties. You see, we, all these garden varieties of anxieties, you know, are we accepted, are we loved, are we popular, are we rich, are we, you know, um, are we going to have perfect health for the next thousand years, I mean, all these anxieties, you know. Uh, once we get our real identity, who we are in Christ, these things fall into place. By these less crucial anxieties, one can refer to those garden variety anxieties that center around one's health needs, security needs, companionship, intimacy needs, awareness of one's vocational needs, political needs, societal needs, and then we get to some idea of the societal needs. Okay? So, this is uh, written by Murray Bowen, and I'm going to let you just read this on your own. You've got it. It's just an interesting kind of a sideline, okay, sidebar. So it's all about family dynamics and what happens in the family when and you're trying to protect someone or whatever. So it's, 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 it's sending, but it's not to the core of our relationship. So the conclusion. One need only be somewhat awake to know that there seems to be a critical rise in the increase of garden variety anxieties. Increase in the need for mental health assistance over the board, especially by our youth. Increase in suicides. Decrease in religious affiliations with little being seen to compensate for one's need to share one's spiritual journey with others. Increase in complexities of technology with which Many seem not to be able to cope, especially the elderly, like me. You know, I, I have a computer, too, that comes in every week and helps me with my phone and, and computer and uh, Roku and you name it, okay? Cameras. Okay. Increasing loss of employment due to artificial intelligence, AI advancement. A lot of jobs are being lost because of AI. The, the robots are taking over. Let's face it, okay? Uh, Increasing uh, parent breakdown in couple and family one-to-one -one with communication uh, due to the prevalence of social media and not knowing how to deal with it and integrate it into your life. Increasing epidemic of drug and alcohol addictions. The curtain passes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> really, that's her curtain call. Right? <laughs> Increasing divide between the haves and have-nots. The elimination of nuclear arms that potentially can destroy our known world. The results that are coming from climate change to our extreme weather, rising ocean levels, lack of clean water, degrading, etc. These are only ten of the most evident of the issues that are having an effect on our garden variety anxieties. Right or wrong? Right. Just some of them. I'm not saying they're all. But yeah. they're <laughs> the urgent need lies before us all to discover who we really are, our identity in relationship with God, others, creation, and ourselves. But it's always that fourfold relationship with God, others, ourselves, and creation. Okay? Before our anxieties turn into full-blown fears that completely incapacitate all of us. So, that was my little presentation. <laughs> so, now if you want to pick a little bit, if you want to have questions, or responses, Disagreements, whatever. The floor is yours. When you were talking earlier about um, listening to the news and how anxious it makes us because there's, you know, they only report the horrible things that are happening. And um, I have started, I'm not going to say I always because I do listen to the news sometimes, but I've started not <coughs> listening to it because you're going to hear it somewhere or another. Yeah, During the day, or gonna break in, huh? Yeah. Breaking news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I I think it's important, you know, that maybe we need to do something about um, how the news is presented to us. You know, I I I don't know what that would be. I'm you know, but I, I think you know. People need to think about 
what they're hearing because with all the channels that we have, right. you know, there's a lot that can give you such anxiety because. Oh my gosh, you just, if you want to watch YouTube the rest of your life, you, yeah. you wouldn't have enough years to do it. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, yeah, the, the news though, the news is completely at our mercy, and that's because we could turn them off or change the channel, and then they'd lose money, and then, frankly, if they weren't alarming, they'd go right out of business. That's right. You know, so, so they are, they are terrified, well, not terrified, but, you know, from a capitalistic perspective, they have to prey on your anxiety in order to keep their jobs and to keep this, this news machine that they've built right, and to yeah. be interesting 24 hours a day. Right. Um, they have to be scary and intense and overwhelming and, and get you to feel... Yeah, but to make oh. them money, they shouldn't... That, that, well, even the weatherman does it, right? Yeah. 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 They're yeah. terrible. Mm -hmm. yeah. You think when you have all these hurricanes, people are glued to the weather channel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can't get enough. It's like more and more and more. I want to hear more about Puerto Rico. I want to hear more about this. Yeah. When is enough enough? Okay. Father, Father John Kenny, God rest his soul, yeah. had a name for our weathermen. He called them weather terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. John Kenny died just a little while ago. was a great man. Uh, so I like that. I've got to remember that. Weather terrorists. All right. Good. Thank you, Kelly. That's a good point, though. I mean, the news gives us what we ask for. And if it doesn't satisfy us, we will turn it off and they'll lose uh, advertisers. And so, I mean, it's, but it's our responsibility to determine when is enough enough. When do we have enough information? And when do we need to sit in silence and let God love us? calm our anxieties. You know, this is this is the question. And if we're constantly, you know, having to Twitter and, and text and, and call and and everything and be with people all the time and be busy and everything, we're gonna have anxiety. It is just going to happen. And unless we learn how to shut everything off and go into silence and let God love us. Just take a sun bath in God's love every day. There's no other way that I know of that you can deal with all the anxiety in the world. I don't. If I knew another way, I'd be honor bound to tell you, but I don't. I know I continue to have my two periods of centering prayer of 30 minutes each. Uh, the first thing in the morning and then about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, complete silence. I've been teaching and practicing this since 1977, okay, and it's transformed my life. <coughs> I do not know how I could live without it. I need to sit in there and say, hello, my name is Joachim, I'm an addict, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> an addict to silent prayer, okay. And but it changes your life. Oh, it does, it transforms you, but it's not you that's doing it. God's transforming right. you. You're just allowing God to do it. Mm -hmm. But God is not going to break in and say, well, you shut up, I want to talk to you. No. God waits for silence and for space. And if we don't give it, we're gonna one of the results is anxiety, okay? What was that? I was I was gonna give you this nice joke here. What was that? Uh, one of the things that I, I did put in my mind, it was this neat little quotation from um, Roar that I liked. I'm gonna be probably giving it in the homily to the nuns on uh, at, at Marywood, I give celebrate mass there quite often. Uh, it says, "You can only miss something that you have searched for and partially experienced." Okay, you can only miss something that you have searched for and partially experienced. In fact, you do not even search for it until you have already. This is this sense of, <coughs> of experiencing God in the silence, and uh, it's great. You know, but it, it, it's not this, this frenetic searching for God. I've got to find God. I've got to find God. I've got to know more about God. I've got to study scripture. I've got to memorize quotes. Oh, that's frenetic anxiety. 
I like the story of the, the guy that was out in the river baptizing, right? I think some of you may have heard that one. And uh, wasn't getting any money to be baptized. And so this guy was walking along the edge of the river and he very obviously had a little bit too much to drink, you know. So he's walking. So, hey, you, come over here. Oh, me? Yeah, I knew you. Do. I comes out to the river, you know. <laughs> and the guy says, all right, I'm going to help you out here. And he pushes his head down the water. He comes up. He says, did you find Jesus? He says, no, I didn't. Put him down again longer. <laughs> did you find Jesus? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> he puts him down a long time. Long <laughs> He comes up. Did you find Jesus? The guy looks at him and says, Are you sure this is where he fell in? <laughs> <laughs> so, my friends, it's not so much finding God as letting God find. Letting God relieve you of these anxieties because they are nothing else than a sign that we're not connected sufficiently with God. Because God will envelop us. You know, just all we've got to do is give permission. Right? Oh, we have just about three or four minutes, so it's stump the priest time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to say something. Um, I um, I have had a good faith and a, a, a great belief in um, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and um, I felt them in my life, and um, I I really thought I was living um, the way He wanted me to live, and then I was introduced to centering prayer. And it changed everything. Yeah. Now, it didn't make what I believed before wrong. It just added to it. And if anybody hasn't done that, they really need to try that. Because it, it, if you can commit yourself to even a week, at the end of that week, you will, you will be amazed at the comfort and the the knowledge and the closeness that you have to God. I appreciate you saying that. I wish I had a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> a great testimony. Thank you. Thank you. How does one learn to do that? That's a good question. I'm glad you I have that. never been able to connect to anything that's going to tell me what to do, how to do it. And well, Lord knows I'm retired. I have plenty of time. Guess what? Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> Kelly can tell you exactly. That's one reason why we're videoing these, these talks and conferences. Five years ago, in 2013, I taught three classes on the introduction to Centrum Prayer. And they're all on the uh, website of the Catholic Invite Center. And they're also, by the way, on YouTube because our Kelly and Irene and so forth have found a way to put them on YouTube. Awesome. That's, that's on my to-do list for my computer tutor to show me how to do that. <laughs> and then those are, those are telling you about Centering Prayer. Yeah. And if you're interested in joining a group, you yeah. can call us and we've got contacts of people who we can give you to and then you can figure out what times during the week it works. There are several groups that meet that do it together. So. There's a group that meets here on Tuesday nights, yes. right? Mm -hmm. We're in that. But there's also one We're I... We're in that, okay. Yeah, there's one I think at the Dominican Center, too. There's one Dominican Center, yes. But, uh, you know, it's like trying to describe swimming when you've never been in the water. You, you I can. don't swim either. Well... <laughs> I'm in uh, real trouble here, trust me. Or just... Taking a bath, all right? Don't tell me you had not taken a bath, all right? <laughs> so it's this getting wet, it's experiencing, okay? And uh, we can, some people will just wait until they got enough information and then, oh, they'll, you know, they just want to read more and then, you know, just got to think more. That's what the, uh, 
that's the tradition or the typical sense of the uh, the uh, the fives on the Enneagram. You know, this wanting more information, more information, more information, and uh, they cannot get enough. And uh, but that can keep you. That can be an obstacle to going into the experience it because you just got to figure it out first that's all anybody's welcome to come on tuesday night at seven o'clock it's right in this room right here this room right across the hall and if you show up and just show up i did it on our website you can go to videos and then there's one with centery prayer and it has all of father joachim's centering prayer classes on it so you can find out more about it and you just show up does it go through the summer time yes it's like every week right yes Yes, every, every week. You know, 52 weeks a year, I think. But oh my goodness. It, it's, uh, well, Christmas and Easter. Christmas, maybe. maybe not. <laughs> it happened on Christmas Day, maybe not. <laughs> but I, I would feel like all of my effort in preparing this class and all the others is worthwhile if just some of you start experiencing the beauty, the value of this kind of prayer. I feel, like a, I feel like a philanthropist every time I teach it, okay? Uh -huh. I really do. I'd rather do anything than to, than, to, uh, than I just feel like this is what's needed more than anything else. This is the treasure, this is the hidden treasure in the church. I just got through teaching four weeks at Calvin College on, on the uh, continuing education program, call, they call it, mm -hmm. and uh, on the seven themes of Richard Rohr, okay? And they don't video like we do, all right, so you can't, you know, get it. But uh, <clears throat> the hunger of the 36 people in my class, uh, three were Catholic, one was Jewish, the rest I think were all Christian Reformed. They could not get enough. Hmm. They don't, see that most of the Protestants just put that under the rug. After, when Martin Luther and Calvin, all the, all that stuff, just when they broke from the Catholic Church, you know, they did not transcend and include, they just excluded, okay? So they've lost that mystic tradition, the contemplative tradition, uh, that is so the wealth of the church. I mean, St. Teresa of Avalon, St. Master Eckhart, St. Uh, um, John of the Cross. I mean, treasures! Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they don't have that. So they, won't, they want me to teach contemplation now at... Uh, at, uh, at Calvin. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to do it in the fall, but I'm teaching at, uh, at Ali at the Aquinas College in the fall. I, I try to alternate back and forth, besides my classes here, you know. So, uh, But the Tuesday group, there's a, there's a lot of different denominations in the group. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's we have, not, usually have a book that It's ecumenical. It. It's, it's interfaith. It's everything. It's, mm -hmm. it's no direct theology you've got to buy in order to be a participant, no. You just sit there and, and go into silence and let God love you. That's all. Just let God, that's all God wants to do is to let you know how much God loves you. That's all, right? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank it's been you. a joy to celebrate with you and to enjoy and share with you. And let's just have a little prayer as we prepare to journey. Okay? Loving God, thank you for including us in your Trinitarian love relationship. Help us to have more hunger, more thirst for that kind of deep love relationship that gives true meaning to our lives. That takes away these anxieties that cripple us and take away our joy and peace. Help us to hunger for you as you hunger for us. Give us a safe night of hope, a safe trip home, and a restful summer. I pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.